small double sideband transceivers are great, but one of their disadvantages is you cannot easily hear one on another. Yes, you can hear that the signal is there, but it can often be difficult to tune in, especially when there's a bit of fading or phase variation on the signal between the transmitter and you. In this video, I'll show how you can resolve double sideband signals on a direct conversion receiver using equipment you possibly already have. Before all that, we'll go back to the late 1950s, as it was from an article in that era that I got the idea for what I'm about to describe. Back then, SSB was only within reach for people with deep pockets. If you're going to build an SSB rig, then you'd either need to mess around with a fiddly phasing network to generate phasing type SSB, or use crystal filters. Many amateurs back then were lucky enough to have a few crystals on amateur band frequencies. Having multiple crystals, especially if they are the same or on nearby frequencies, would be an extravagance that few amateurs of the time would be able to afford. Plus there's the alignment and extra stages that filter type SSB rigs would involve. Now if we go back to the main reason that people went to SSB from AM, it was because of the carrier. Carriers would heterodyne and create interference. If you could get rid of the carrier, even if you kept both sidebands, you would still be able to reduce the amount of interference you'd cause on the band. And your double sideband signal or should I say double sideband suppressed carrier signal, would still be resolvable as single sideband on a proper single sideband transceiver. Or the receiver, as amateurs back then often used separate receivers and transmitters. This famous article by J.P. Costas, W2CRR, started a mini revolution in double sideband. He explained that in the case of random interference, that double sideband could be as good, if not better, than SSB. And it would be a lot simpler to generate. Even existing AM and CW transmitters could be converted to transmit double sideband. The normal way of doing that is if you've got a push-pull final amplifier using two tubes, then you arrange it so that you put in audio into the second grid and RF into grid 1 and provided you've got the circuitry connected right you can suppress the carrier and transmit the sidebands providing a double sideband suppressed carrier signal. That operation could be done at fairly high power so if you wanted to you could just connect the antenna up to it and you'd be on the air. There's articles on all that mostly from the late 50s and early 60s, on W4JKL's website. If you look through the list and click on some of the links, you'll see that some people had problems in resolving double sideband, a bit like what I spoke about earlier on with direct conversion receivers. At this stage, most amateurs were using superhead receivers. However, their selectivity was often broad, because crystal filters then were only a part of more advanced receivers. That was fine for SSB, but there are still issues with resolving double sideband. Because of that, not very many people seem to persist with double sideband. Besides, with manufacturers like Collins, Swan, Drake, and later Japanese manufacturers, many amateurs found it easier just to buy their next SSB transceiver. So all the experiments with double sideband were forgotten. There is, however, an interesting article by W4PGI on inverted audio for double sideband. This was based on a novel double sideband transmitter. It was still double sideband, but the audio was arranged differently in such a manner that it was easier to resolve even on a receiver with broad selectivity. This shows what a double sideband signal looks like. Frequency across the bottom and amplitude up here. There's nothing around the part of the suppressed carrier, but if you go a little bit either side, 
These are your sidebands carrying voice energy. 300 hertz to 3 kilohertz above and an identical sideband 300 hertz to 3 kilohertz below. Note though that because double sideband gear doesn't have sharp filtering, the filtering will be somewhat gentler and you might still have some extra audio energy up around 4 kilohertz or more. If we look at what we had before with a direct conversion receiver, it's got a wide band pass covering both sidebands and you get a lot of distortion and problems because they're trying to receive both sidebands at once and you might have phase distortion or a slight frequency drift and an audio signal here, let's say one or two kilohertz, we'll have an audio signal down here, one or two kilohertz, then these two signals coming out from the receiver's product detector will interact with each other in all sorts of strange ways and may cancel each other out. And when you consider a complex voice waveform with many signals in this range, then it can sound quite bad. So that was one of the reasons for the double sideband sounding poor on a direct conversion receiver because of its wide bandwidth. If you're to use a single sideband receiver with half the band pass, you're only resolving one of the sidebands and there's far less problems. Same goes when you're trying to resolve SSB on a direct conversion receiver. Again, it's fine, provided there isn't interference close by. Now, we'll go back to W4PGI's double sideband signal. He inverted the audio. What that means is that an audio signal of 300 hertz actually comes out at around 3 kilohertz, and an audio signal at 3 kilohertz comes out at around 300 hertz. In other words, audio is transposed. Highs become lows, and lows become highs. To achieve it, you need some extra circuitry or, as I mentioned before, some equipment you may already have to invert the audio. This was done by subtracting the audio coming in from the microphone amplifier from a local audio oscillator signal of around 3 kHz. That and the double sideband was generated in a 7360 tube which was then commonly used for balance modulator service. All up, it was a simple circuit and very elegant, with the finals being two 6146s. The effect of inverting the speech audio in the transmitter before it reaches the balance modulator stage is that the audio is inverted on the transmitted signal. Instead of low frequency parts of your voice being only a few hundred hertz away from your suppressed carrier, it's your high frequency parts of your voice that are around it. And conversely, your 300 hertz part of the audio spectrum is in the far outer ends of the signal. That's true for both sidebands. Now, the benefit of this, if you're using a broad receiver, is that to resolve this signal, you would set your receiver about 3 kilohertz off frequency. You'd set it about here. And that would resolve one sideband, 300 hertz to 3 kilohertz. It would be on its lower sideband. And you wouldn't have interference from the other sideband because your receiver selectivity would start to drop off at around 3 or 4 kilohertz. So this part would be greatly attenuated. And even if it wasn't, it would not contribute to the audio sounding weird, like if you're trying to resolve double sideband on a broad receiver. Now, if there is some interference up the dial a bit on this side of the frequency, then that's easy enough to sort out because you can just tune your receiver down here. We go down three kilohertz and then another three kilohertz and we resolve it as an upper sideband signal. 
Another thing is that this signal is probably a slightly narrower bandwidth than a conventional double sideband signal as any of your higher frequency artifacts above 3 kilohertz are still within the two sidebands of the signal rather than spreading outward as would be the case otherwise. This was a very ingenious and probably undervalued technique at the time. However, within a few years it got overtaken. SSB supplanted AM and double sideband for most HF amateurs. Also, if you did persist with double sideband, people's receivers were getting more selective because they were SSB receivers, so there would be less of a problem in resolving double sideband anyway. So this technique, described more than 60 years ago, has largely been forgotten. However, it can be revived and it doesn't have to be used on the transmitter. We could instead use it on the receiver. Again, it's a similar benefit. Instead of having your direct conversion receiver centered here, you would tune it off to one side and you'd be able to hear the signal without issues from the other sideband. That's fine if the double sideband station has inverted their transmit audio. But that's unlikely to be the case because that's not what the MDT, the Beach 40 or other double sideband rigs do. You can still receive their signals. All you need to do is to invert the audio at the receiving rather than the transmitting end. That's what I'll describe next. Let's say you have an SSB transmitter and an SSB receiver. It doesn't matter what frequencies they're on. They could be non-amateur gear such as CB equipment. In this case, we'll only be using them into dummy loads and not radiating a signal. If you've got a 21.2 MHz upper sideband transmitter, then you can resolve its audio plainly and uninverted with a receiver, also upper sideband, also tuned to 21.2 MHz. But if you want to easily invert the audio, then you just flip the receiver to lower sideband and move its frequency up to 21.203. That way you have a simple audio inverter. Audio coming in through here and audio coming out to receive your signal on the speaker here. That's the simplest audio speech inverter any amateur could put together. It requires no assembly, soldering or circuits. Although if you wanted to, you could borrow from the electronic music crowd and copy some of their circuits. Although some of their circuits might introduce a bit of distortion that we don't want for this application. This technique is also sometimes used in simple voice scrambler systems. So have a look on the web for voice scramblers and you might see some circuitry that could be useful for these sorts of experiments. Anyway, today I'll just assume you've got a SSB transmitter that you're putting the audio from your direct conversion double sideband thing in and you've got a SSB receiver and it can just be a portable SSB receiver. It doesn't have to be particularly elaborate. Here I'm transmitting double sideband from room to room. It's in return travellers in hotel quarantine there. Several Kiwis made their way into the state. You might recognise the rig as the MDT from OzQRP. Right next beside it, I have an FT817 with a dummy load. I've got the receiver on 21203 lower sideband. As you might expect, the audio is unintelligible. Now see what happens when I detune the direct conversion receiver. As you've just seen, the now inverted signal 
is now audible. What was inverted audio is now intelligible. Whereas the audio coming out of the receiver is inverted. I've done that by tuning about 3 kilohertz above the suppressed carrier frequency. This is the inverted audio coming out of the Beach 40. If I've got inverted audio coming in, being transmitted on upper sideband, then it forms a lower sideband signal as heard on the portable receiver. What was inverted audio is now intelligible. Another thing that's interesting is there's actually two points on the direct conversion receiver's tuning range where you can get good audio. That's 3 kilohertz below and 3 kilohertz above your centre frequency. This is below. Then I'm tuning through the centre frequency. And this is above. Now I should mention that the audio you're hearing is going through two lots of speaker to microphone coupling. So it won't be nearly as good as if you had a direct connection. Still, it shows that voice inversion works and can help you resolve double sideband on a direct conversion receiver. All you need is an SSB transmitter, frequency not critical, and a small receiver. The receiver is receiving on the opposite sideband, so allows you to invert the audio.